Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. This is Charles Rogel at DecisionWise. I work as a senior consultant here. Today we're going to be talking about getting the most out of your 360 degree feedback experience. Our presenter today is Dan Decca. Hello Charles. Dan is also one of our senior consultants here. He uh, kind of owns um, kind of our 360 feedback uh, consulting uh, services and um, does a lot of coaching, does a lot of training on 360s, does our uh, what biannual 360 degree feedback workshop to train HR professionals on how to debrief 360s. So he's quite the expert, loves coaching people on 360s. I do. And uh, has a lot of great information to share with us today as we go through um, you know, kind of getting the most out of this 360 process. So, Dan, I'll let you uh, jump in, kick off, add anything else to your introduction, if you'd mm. like, to your background, um, and then jump into the agenda. Sure. Well, Charles, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I love doing these with you. And uh, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, wherever you're joining from, we so appreciate you taking the time and uh, spending your valuable time with us. So in the intro that I did, I, I wanted to share some thoughts around um, getting the most out of your 360 experience. I feel very passionate about this, and I love 360s, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me go over our purpose and desired outcomes. Yeah. So the purpose really is to help you get the most out of your 360 experience. And whether you're facilitating the process, if you're an HR administrator, or you're a leader in a group, or whether you're just participating in it and you're doing a 360 just for you, I want to just help you get more and uh, out of that experience and that investment. And our desired outcomes for today, generally, I, I want to help reduce the stress and improve the impact of your investment. Sometimes there can be a lot of stress around this. People feel pretty vulnerable. I'm doing a survey. Other people are doing the survey. What are they going to say about me? And it makes sense that there be some concerns, but I think if we go through this, Charles, we can help reduce a little bit of that stress. And the pattern that we're going to take and the path that we're going to take is I'm going to outline some actions and questions that actually make up the 360 process and timeline so you can see what that path looks like. And then I'm going to share and identify some patterns and principles that I found um, that actually help, that help turn that 360 process into a much more engaging experience and more productive and then I'd like to illustrate how you take some of these principles and apply them to people's unique situations because okay. you could be in a very different situation. You could be in a large multinational corporation. You could be in a small organization that has 10 people. And, uh, but the thing with principles is they apply to any situation, right. at least good ones do. And so we'll do that. And then ultimately I want people to leave this call feeling more confident and capable about navigating your 360 experience. And even beyond that, these principles, really good principles, can be applicable to anything. So hopefully the things that we discussed today can help you um, with the rest of your day or with any other challenges that you've got. Excellent. Perfect. So that's the plan. All right. So starting off, what are these seeds that you want to plant? Help us plant. Well, just from a starting point, I think uh, when we talk about 360s and, and just to level set with some people that maybe you've never done one before, I mean, the idea of a 360 is – we pick a list of questions and you rate yourself on that. And then you ask other people to rate you on those same questions. So your boss, maybe your boss's boss, your um, direct reports, your peers and others. And you get this 360 degree view of this feedback. And then at the end, you're able to go, um, how did I rate myself? How do others? And you're able to see if there's any differences there that you need right. to respond to. So just to set that, that, that that's what a 360 is about. And... As an overarching thought, I think a lot of times when I'm talking with people and they're preparing for these things, um, this thought is helpful, that they're facilitating or participating in a human experience, not just a process. Yeah. We can get so distracted by choosing the survey, administering the survey, who gets the report, that we actually lose connection with the idea that this is a very connected and involved process. There's a lot of people that get involved, and it can be a very personal experience for people. So I think that is a big overarching thought is you're dealing with people, you're dealing with humans, and we're, we want to keep that in mind. It's not just a system and a process. Yeah, really good point. And then the other thought is, and I've talked about this in a previous webinar, Charles, I think that we've done around like what is a 360. I described what it is technically, but from a design standpoint, it's a purposely designed disruption. Like we are trying to create a disruption for the individual that takes this 360. I wish I could say that I learned 
um, all the lessons in my life by reading books <laughs> or by learning from the experiences of others. But unfortunately, it seems like the place I learn most from is from adversity, from challenge, and from disruptions. And we want to create a disruption to the way that they see themselves, to the way we see ourselves. And, and then we want to create an environment around that disruption to turn it into a learning event where they can learn and grow. That's a great point because I think most of us can think back to times in our life where we pivoted or changed based on a disruptive event. Some kind of action, conversation, experience we had really changed our perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it happens all the time. And we're actually very well versed at responding to that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the train doesn't come on time. The plane is delayed. Um, you get some report back from a medical situation. Things don't work as you planned. It's a disruption. And then how do we respond to that? Right. So, But when it comes to a 360, it seems like a lot of people, and it makes sense, can put up a lot of walls around it and get very sensitive and kind of close down yeah. around it. So those are some fundamental thoughts. And then I think as I'm talking about this is, is try to recreate that, three, that story around the 360 and the narrative and maybe plant some new seeds. Because I think what most people expect is we're going to do a 360. I'm going to get it. I'm going to look at it. And yeah, maybe I'll do something with it. Sure. And often they get filed in the desk drawer or put <laughs> on the shelf. Right. And, and I think one of the reasons is, is because there is some disruption there and people don't know exactly what to do with it. They're kind of left to their own devices and they'll leave it. Yeah, it's not but, comfortable. No, but we can do some things that help with that. And one of them is, I think a common response to it is that's what it's going to look like. But what I find when I do 360s, and I just did one about an hour and about an hour ago, the more common response and experience that I get from people when we debrief their 360s is, is this, oh, they see it too, mm -hmm. you know, or, and, and I hear people say, well, there's no big surprises in there other than actually one of the surprises is they think I'm doing a lot better than I think right, I am. Yeah. And that's a really healthy response. And, and people end up saying, you know, I can, I can see why they might say these things. And, and they're surprised that they're not more surprised by the results. Everyone sees this, and it's a much more positive experience. No surprises. I think I can do this. Yep. And that is, that is the 99% experience that I have with 360s. But this kind of story and fear arises that I'm going to be blindsided by something. And I think a lot of this work around 360s moves from the place of people are good. <laughs> they want to help. Um, they're trying to help you. Right. And, and they're trying to share these things. And we're going to do this 360. And they're going to do it in the best way possible. And uh, so, so those are some thoughts, just a starting point planting some seeds around a different narrative around 360s. Great. Charles, for the, the, the kind of plan here is, is I want to illustrate what the, what the, three pro, the 360 process looks like. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to refer to it, Charles, as the jungle gym. This is our <laughs> playground for today and for this webinar is to illustrate this path of what happens in a 360 survey. So if you're setting it up, um, there are some things and some actions that you need to take. So you need to decide which survey am I going to use, um, who's going to rate me, mm -hmm. how long is the survey going to be administered for, and then once we administer the survey and we get a report, what do we do with it? Yep. And and then what's the expectation after that? What what am I going to do with that report? How do I turn it into action and how do I follow through on it? So this is the base that we'll talk about um, throughout the the whole webinar. But I wanted to expound on some of the questions that are behind some of these steps. Yeah. So because there's considerations for each piece of this. Yeah, and they get they get deeper, and and some of these things um, are what hold people back. Is they're like, well, first I don't know what questions I'm going to ask, and I wanted to kind of put those out there mm -hmm. so people know what questions and and how to prepare for them. Yeah. So one of them is like, why are we doing the survey? Which survey are we going to use? Um, at DecisionWise, we've got four different ones we use. We have an individual contributor, we have a team lead, a business lead, and an executive 360. Uh, what questions are we going to use? How many should there be? Mm -hmm. How long is that going to take? And then we get into this deeper discussion around, should we use the standard 360s, like those four that I described, or should we create a customized one? And you know, what I'm talking about in creating a customized 360 is we'll take the organization's values, their mission statements, and we'll align questions and create customized questions so when people take it, they can see their company values and mission in there. And then, well, once we determine which survey, does it need to be approved by anyone? So those are all some questions that come up for people at that, at that start. 
Then when we move to the Raider selection, big questions and thoughts around, well, who chooses the Raiders? Does the manager choose them? Does HR choose them? Does the person choose them? And if they choose them, how many should they have? Can you have too many, too little? And then, well, who approves this? You know, if we say that, yeah, the, the employee and the participant will choose the Raiders, does it get improved in any way? So then as we move into survey administration, there's questions around, well, when do you launch it? How long does it take to set this up? How long should the survey be open? Should it be two weeks, three weeks, a month? And then when do you close it? Do you close it just based on a timeline? Do you close it based on participation rates? So those are all questions there. Then we get, Charles, to I know one of your favorite parts is the report delivery. Right. And where, <laughs> who gets the report? Who do you deliver it to? Does it go to the employee? Does it go to the manager? Does it go to HR? Does it go to everyone? Um, when do they get it? When do they get the report? Like how soon um, after the, rep- the survey is closed? How close to a debrief if we're going to have one of those? Yep. And then what do they do with it? And who do they share it with? Is there an expectation that they share this report or is it just for them? A bunch of questions around report delivery. And then we move into action planning. And that's basically how do you take someone from getting this feedback to turning it into an action plan and change? So we believe very strongly, I know you do too, Charles, around the power of a debrief. And we'll talk more about that. But do they get a debrief with someone either internally or externally to their organization, meaning internal one of their HR people or maybe someone that's gone through a 360 or who's been certified in a debrief process or external, like one of us, um, to actually debrief those results to help explain the report um, and then and then help them create an action plan. And like, how long should the debrief be? Should it be 30 minutes or 60 minutes or 90? And by the way, where's the manager fit in all this? And then that final stage of follow through um, goes to, you know, what are the expectations and what is our thoughts around accountability and success for this? So I just wanted to lay that out, Charles, around these are the key steps and some of the key questions that I found to be very helpful. And I think it's helpful when you know these questions, you're able to think about them, have yeah. some answers, you can create a better experience. Perfect. So the next stage is... If you are standing at um, a decision point, like one of these decision points, so those many questions that I just asked, sure. you know, then what might help you navigate those? And what I found are these four patterns or principles that I want to share, um, and this is what they are. So how do you honor agency? How do you invite connection? How do you support through this disruption? And how do you recreate the center? Yep. And Charles, I know those are kind of in code right now. Um, but what I want to do now is I want to go back to that, that playground and, that, and, uh, and show how each of these would show up. Right. And just at a high level, let me just give you a, a, a quick thought around them. So honoring agency refers to the idea that we, as individuals, we all want to choose what we do. In, in the book written about engagement um, that we have here from DecisionWise, and we refer to that as autonomy. Um, and we are all born and possess this desire to choose. Um, little babies don't like being told what to do. CEOs don't like being told what to do. Everyone right. likes to demonstrate their own agency and their own choice. And so the premise there is, how do you honor agency, someone's choice, at all those steps and decision points throughout the 360 process? And my kind of premise is the more that you honor their individual agency, the more that they will accept the process, the more they'll put into it, and the more they'll get out of it. Yeah, because you're trying to essentially have them own the feedback, own the process, Mm. uh, or or, or feel more ownership for it, as well as um, dispel any resistance they might have. So are they going to discount the feedback in any way? But the more ownership they have in the process, the more they feel like they're in control, um, the better the outcomes. Yeah, and you want to start that throughout the end. You don't want to wait to make sure that they feel ownership once they get the report. Yeah, You want them to be involved. I mean, early and often <clears throat> works much better than at the end. So that's what I mean by honoring agency. And then inviting connection is, is similar, and it's related to it. We want to invite people to connect. We want them to connect to their feedback providers. We want them to connect to their manager. Yeah. We want them to connect to the actual report. We want them to connect to their stakeholders. 
And so everything that we do when we have these decision points is how do we increase connections? We don't want to decrease connections or isolate in this process. We want to increase connections. So I'll illustrate what that looks like. Well, it's the discussion afterwards that's more important than what the actual data says. Mm -hmm. You want people to talk to each other. Yeah. And that's actually... That's actually a good one for Charles for that last one, recreate the center, mm -hmm. because a lot of times when people think about doing 360s and they think about a debrief that we're going to have, they think, oh, I know what's going to happen on this call. Dan, you're going to tell me what my strengths are, and I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're going to tell me what my lowest scores are, and, and we're going to try to create a plan to make those better. And I'm like, no, that's not what we're going to do. What we find <laughs> to be much more effective is to recreate the center, actually at the center of the debrief conversation and ask someone and build everything around the debrief around this one question. What are the one or two most important things you want to accomplish in the next six to 12 months? And let's have a debrief about that. And let's use the 360 feedback and see what it says and how we can accelerate the attainment of those goals. Mm -hmm. So we recreate the center and move it from it's around the 360 process, it's around the 360 report, and we move it to it's around helping you achieve the goals that are most important to you. And man, people feel, feel way more engaged and excited about having that conversation than just responding to some feedback. Yeah. And then the other one in there, and, and they're not in any order. They all work together as support through the disruption. So... You know, we've talked about how a 360 can be disruptive, and actually that's the purpose. It's purposely designed to do that, but we can do things and support people throughout that whole process to help them turn that disruption into a learning opportunity. Great. So, and my hope, honestly, Charles, is, I mean, we do a lot of work around engagement, mm -hmm. and uh, you could take these principles and, and, and apply them to engagement work, too, around, hey, how do you honor the agency and the choice of everybody doing that engagement survey? Right. How do you invite them to connect, support them through the disruption, and how do you recreate the center, not just around the, the, the report of the engagement survey, but actually what are the goals for the company? So I'm, I'm hoping that these things can be applicable to a bunch of different situations. Yep. So then the next thing that I want to do is, is illustrate um, how these each show up across um, our structure, our 360 structure. So, and we'll do that for each one of the, of the principles. So on this one, there is a quote that I like, Charles. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you like I, lots of quotes. I, yeah, I don't, I don't mention a bunch of them, but I love C.S. Lewis. And um, this idea of the task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts, you know, that idea of like, what type of work are we doing when we're doing this 360? We want to irrigate, we want to provide that water to, so the seeds that are already there within the person and the process can grow. Sure. So I, I thought that was a great illustration of kind of this, these thoughts that I'll show you, but practically like how that shows up. When we're starting off a 360, um, when we do a scoping conversation, I'm going to ask whoever the person is, whether they're, do, they're facilitating the process or, or they're the one that was going through it, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to achieve? And when they say to me, well, Dan, we want to do a 360, um, I go, yeah, I, I understand that. Right, to but, what end? Yeah, and for the sake of what? Like you're doing a 360 for, for what reason? And, and I ask them to tell me, tell me more about the context of your situation, because it varies so greatly. You may be in a situation where we've never done a 360 before in an organization. You may be where they've done them in the past, and they actually weren't very well received. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any support around it. It was very disruptive. Um, you may have um, organizations where we've never done one. This happens a lot. But boy, the new leader that's in our organization used to do them at his last company, and he wants to do them now. Uh -huh. Those are all really unique situations. And it's very helpful to have these conversations and get really clear on your scope. So why are we doing it? For the sake of what? What's the context? And then what's your greatest need or hope This about this process? I mean, this is very similar to recreating the center. Um, but that idea is like, we're doing this to solve some issue or problem or to improve some situation. And what is that? Yeah. And boy, once you get that scope out and you help people define that, I mean, a lot of times if they've never done something before, they don't know what questions to ask. So these are some great ones to think about. But when you ask them the questions, you can get it out. It, it, it comes out and they're able to share those thoughts. And then from there, you can go into that process of what survey fits best. Yeah. Now that I understand what you're trying to achieve, okay, which survey? And then all these processes start fitting in there. So like I said before, do we want to use a standard survey? 
one of ours, so an individual contributor, team leader, business leader, or executive leader, or do we want to create a customized solution? Um, those are some very helpful conversations to have to set up that structure. Yep. Okay. okay. So then once we they do that, and that's really around survey selection, when we move to rater selection, um, there's a bunch of different ideas about this. Um, so commonly what happens is um, probably at the base level is, look, we're just going to select raters based on structure. So we're going to have your manager do it because you report to your manager. We're going to have your direct reports and we're going to have your peers. And all of those are just standard in our reporting structure. Yeah. That's kind of like the base. And so we have that. Um, there's no real discussion about that. It's just like that's who it is. But then you could add more. You could add others. You could add customers. You could add an other category. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be some conversation about that. So that's when we get into this conversation of, well, well, who chooses those? And in general, when you look at this honor the agency that they have, I'd encourage people to let, let the participants select mm -hmm. who they would like to be rated on. And so, and an idea is let them suggest their feedback providers. Um, and there's a question like, how many? I'm like, as many as makes sense. There's no systemic you know, problems on the reporting side to be able to put those numbers together. We can consolidate all that information, but we want to be practical. We don't want to put a, an overdue burden on an organization. So maybe if you have 20 direct reports, maybe you don't need to do all of them. You can do a sampling of them sure. so you can make those choices. And, and then after the employee suggests, this is who I think would be great. I strongly encourage them to involve their manager and have a discussion about that yeah. and share that list and say, you know what, we're doing going through the 360 process. Here's who I think would be helpful. Is there anyone else that you think would be helpful? And, and uh, I think that process is a really good idea for a couple of reasons. You got to involve the manager in the process in some way. Yeah. And, and you want to invo involve them earlier. Um, and also they help provide some perspective. Like you and I, if we're putting a list together, Yes, we're going to be leaning towards choosing people that we know that have very positive interactions with us. Mm -hmm. But there may be others that that we don't have the best interactions or the best history, but their feedback would be super helpful. Sometimes having a third party or a manager can help us do that. And I'd say, you know, general rule of thumb, you know, you at least want to have, you know, two people in each category, two peers, two direct reports, two others. That's how you see results. But, um, you know, more, you want to make sure the people you're including can answer the questions. And so mm -hmm. as you read through the survey and you think about, would people in this other category, maybe this other administrative person I work with, would they be able to, you know, respond to all these statements here? And as you're reading through the survey, you get a better idea of, oh, I see what we're, what mm -hmm. we're asking of them. Uh, that helps me decide who to include. That's great. Yeah, and those numbers, you know, you mentioned – you know, two, yeah, at least two, so we can report out on that data. But you probably want to ask a few more of those oh, because yeah. maybe somebody's on vacation, maybe yeah. somebody doesn't get to it. And so, yeah, we want, to, we want to help people through that process. So the idea there is honoring their agency, let them be involved. The more involved that they are, um, the more commitment that they're going to have to it. Yeah. And then in terms of survey administration, you know, a lot of times you know, we have conversation like, when are we going to do this? We obviously want to consider what's going on. Like right now, we've got a lot of clients, and we're trying to fit 360s in around the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, and just yesterday, I was on a conversation with, with somebody. who we like, hey, are we going to try to squeeze this in? Is that the best idea, or do we wait till January? Right. And, and uh, as we talked through it, we decided to wait till January, where people aren't as distracted, but we can get it all set up now. But you got to think about holidays, workloads, business events that are coming up, um, HR processes, like when's your review process, yep. um, doing a 360, doing your, per, during the performance review process can get kind of confusing, doing a 360, doing an engagement survey and other surveys can be confusing. So we want to kind of plan that out. And, and also I work with clients. So a lot of times the administrator is helping with that, but you can work with clients and you can ask them. We're work, I'm working with a, a very large client where we're going to be doing probably a hundred 360s over the year. And we've created a couple different um, waves of 360s, and we're actually giving them the choice. Do you want to go in wave one in the beginning of the year, or do you want to go in the middle or at the end of the year? Yeah. And so you can give them choice about when, to, when they want to participate. Okay. So that's around survey administration. And then in terms of delivery of the reports, um, 
But the way, there's a bunch of options. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it, 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 it goes to the administrator, and, and so that administrator or HR will have that report. Um, some organizations are send it to the manager, so the manager sees it, um, and the manager will share it with the employee. Some go, let's send it to the manager and employee at the same time. For me, when I'm looking at how do I apply this principle, um, I like the idea of delivering the report directly to the participant mm -hmm. and then letting them choose who they want to share this with. Um, it just gives them you know, that control because there's always this question of like, who else is going to see this, Dan? Yeah. And, and we, we tell them, we tell them, well, this is for, let's, we always make that kind of distinction. Is this for performance or is this for development? And if it's around development, then it should be for them. Yeah. And so there's a lot of times where we say things and I'm, I'm looking at how can we actually prove to people that we mean that? Oh, mm -hmm. it's for your development? We so much mean that it's for your development that we're just going to give that report to you. You choose to use it however you like. Yeah. We're going to invite you. And I'll talk about that in another slide around. We're going to invite you to share your plan. We're going to invite you to have a debrief. We're going to invite you to make to talk with your stakeholders. Um, but we're going to give it to you, and you can move um, as as where you would like to. Sure. Yeah, because I think one thing is um, internally, if you're an HR or a coach um, at your organization, you would see the report as well. But it's all about setting the expectation up front. So as you go into this, you don't yeah. want to then say, oh, by the way, we told you you were the only one mm. that would receive it. But now we're going to give it to the managers, too. Yeah. And that just you know, automatically changes the whole dynamic of the process. Yeah. And that's a great one to, to kind of lean into the conversation around disruptions. Yeah. You know, like how do we turn that disruption into something that they can that they can grow from. Well, one way we can do it with the 360 is not have a lot of disruptions through the process. Yeah. So like you said, clearly say, this is what we're going to do with it. This is when you're going to get it and have all that around it. So the timeline is, is set up and mm -hmm. there's structure, but there's the 360 is not a good place to drop some surprises on people. Exactly. And uh, yeah, that's a disaster. And usually we'd say you might do that the second year as more, you're more comfortable with the process, but the mm -hmm. first time you do this, make it safe, just mm -hmm. give it to the participant. Yep. That's great. And then when we talk around um, just like a general thought, and I'll talk about action planning and, and one of the other principles, but uh, just follow through. Um, you've got a choice. You can tell people what to do or you can ask them. Yeah. Um, you can tell them they need to put it into your LMS or your goal tracking system, or you could ask. You can invite them. And that kind of takes us into the next principle so we can kind of illustrate that. Sure. So – inviting to connect which is is definitely moves from a place of of invitation more asking than telling and just again when we look at this process how do some of these ideas manifest so i talked about you know maybe you're creating a customized survey that are around around um, values of the organization well if we're doing that and say we're doing that with the hr person there's the question around, well, who else is going to see this 360? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you those customized ones go way better when the participants had some input on it. Maybe um, the raters had some. You know, if there is, you know, some, some values, um, how we match up the question to those values that people are familiar with, um, we need to walk through that. And the more eyes that see that and the more people that we invite to take a look and, and approve those questions before we send them out, the better it works. Yeah, because everyone wants to know, what am I going to be held accountable to? Yeah. What am I being measured against? What are the behavioral expectations you have of me as a leader? And this comes into play, so then you get yourself into kind of developing competencies for your leaders too, if you're hmm. starting from scratch, so to speak, and not using a standard survey. And that's where you're saying, okay, what, do we, what behaviors do we want to promote mm -hmm. and what are important for success here? Um, and then as you define those, you're able to then say, okay, what are the specific, you know, competencies and then the behavior statements that we want to use to measure against that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even that fact, what you just described that right there is connection. Yeah. We're connecting to these values that we believe are going to make our business successful. Mm -hmm. And we want more people to understand how to display them. Well, we're going to link that together and yeah. we're going to do a 360 about that. And making that connection is a fantastic move. And then in terms of um, rater selection, just the way that the, this inviting to connect can, can show up, I was just working with someone um, yesterday and helping them to define, like, hey, who, who do I want to get feedback from? And we don't do this in every situation. This all It's dependent upon, you know, the culture of your organization. Yeah. But I was just talking with them, and 
you know, it was pretty clear. Yeah, here's who's my boss is, and my boss's boss, and here are my direct reports and peers. And but then ex- expanding that connection beyond the office. So we just talked about, well, what about your customers? Mm-hmm. Do you want any customers on there? What about partners, people that you work with? Um, and what about even family? Um, not everyone chooses to do that, but I, I can know from, from my perspective, and I'm sure yours, Charles, the best coach I have is my wife. Uh-huh. My kids are teaching me stuff all the time. <laughs> and so involving them in there. And sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Um, but it, again, just inviting them, inviting them to consider and expand those connections. Um, when they get that feedback and we're able to go, well, this is what the work is saying and this is what this, your customers are saying. Here's what your partners are saying. Um, when it all lines up, it's a very strong message. When there's some differences between those groups and we, sh- we say, why are you showing up a little bit differently there? Why, why is that? That's really interesting. Yeah. And we talk about that. That can be very enlightening. And then when you see that and you're like, well, there's one group of raters that I'm, I get very positive ratings from and others a little bit lower. The thing that I'm moving from normally is, well, look, here's proof that you can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, and now how can you take that? So maybe your direct reports ratings are very high, your peers are a little lower. What are you doing with your direct reports that you can do with your peers? And that's a very encouraging thought as opposed to I need to start from scratch and kind of redo the jungle of just no, I actually just need to ir- irrigate some of these relationships yeah. in the same way that I'm currently doing now. And so I think that's how that shows up. And then in terms of other ways that inviting them to connect, we talked a little bit about this, but connecting the timeline to key events, business cycles, outputs, review cycles. And in terms of the report delivery, um, we invite them, I invite them to share. And I don't know, I don't know for you, Charles, and and uh, what a lot of clients ask you, but a lot of times they ask me, Dan, should I just share my report? And and a lot of people that we work with, they're work they're busy and they're working for busy people. Mm-hmm. And what I end up saying to them the majority of the time is, look, your busy boss is less interested about the report. And I tell you what, they're really less interested in is describing in question number twenty two why they rated you lower than you rated yourself. <laughs> right. That's not something that they're looking forward to and not necessarily the most helpful thing. But what they're really interested in is you got this feedback. What did you get out of it? And what are you going to do with it? Yeah. So I encourage people to connect by sharing their plan. Share your plan with with your manager. This is what I'm going to work on. And then that's the place where you can ask what resources do you need and what help do you need? And you can get some suggestions from your manager. And then if you expand that connection between them beyond the manager, a common practice that I have is after they do a 360, I encourage them to read it out to all the people that they invited to provide feedback, not just the, you, you can't tell who provided or who didn't, right. um, but you invite, you, you reach out to everyone. So if you invited 18 people and only 13 completed it, you send an email out to all 18 and say, thanks so much for your feedback. Yeah. I appreciate it. This is what I got out of it. And this is what I'm going to be working on. And I'd really appreciate your help going forward. That's expanding those connections, expanding that support network around this. And then if you go even further than that, and I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail in, a, in another slide, but the idea of you can go even beyond that and go to what I would identify as, as your stakeholders. Like when you create your own action plan, who are the three to five people that are going to benefit most from you or I getting better at this plan? Yeah. And then reach out to them and, and and reach out and follow up with them and go, hey, I'm working on this. Do you have any feedback for me? Um, and that can be a part of the process. That definitely accelerates um, the impact of the report. Yep. And then in terms of um, action planning and then follow through, just try to weave um, this report this into other processes that are already there. So if you already have one-on-one meetings, if you have group meetings where you're sharing maybe some developmental thoughts, um, if you already have um, a development plan that you're working on, weave it into those things. And so all about all of those things are about making more connections. The more connections, literally like all those little pieces in a rope that are all woven together makes it stronger, much more likely that they will be able to take action and be successful with it. Yeah. So that's inviting connection. We've got two more principles and talk about those illustrations. Um, about how do you support through the disruption. So we've talked about you know, how a 360 is a purposely designed disruption and how does that show up. And 
And this, in our little intro, I referred to this as our secret weapon, Charles, <laughs> um, the pre-survey webinar. And this is actually really interesting. It's, these are all kind of connected because a pre-survey webinar increases connections. But the idea of this is you could create your raters, you could get all this set up, and then you could administer the survey. And you could hope that they know what they're doing, they know what it's gonna be used for, and they're gonna fill it out. Yeah. Or you could use a pre-survey webinar. <clears throat> and what we do is we invite all the participants, the participant and all the raters, and we invite them to a webinar, usually about 30 minutes, and we answer some basic questions. Basic questions like this timeline that we're showing right here. How did the survey get chosen? What are the questions that are gonna be on it? How did raters get chosen? When's the survey gonna be open? What's the expectation for what I do with the report? What's the expectation for action planning? And we answer those questions. I mean, you and I have done a bunch of these, and so we have some standard questions. Basically answering those questions that I showed in one of the earlier slides, yeah. answer those for them, and then we also record it, because we know people are busy. We record that webinar, and then we email it out to everyone. And so they have the ability to get their questions answered. And that goes a long way. I, uh, I don't know about you, but I can see the difference in reports when we do a pre-survey webinar, when mm -hmm. people are up to speed and they've answered these questions. If they have questions that aren't answered, they don't share as much feedback. Yeah. They're, they're, if they're unsure on how it's going to be used, is it for performance or development, they're less likely to provide as much feedback. It's not as open and clear. And so that one has a huge impact. Yeah, and this just kind of helps people be more mature about giving feedback. You know, as you're talking to raters, mm -hmm. you understand, they understand how to use the scale, they understand how to respond to the open comments, how the results will be rolled up so it's anonymous and, and confidential. So mm -hmm. it, it dispels a lot of the anxiety they might have about it. They understand at the end that, oh, okay, this is just for development. Mm -hmm. um, and their, you know, and also how important their feedback is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the things that you brought up around confidentiality, that it's anonymous, and being able to explain that to people and yeah. say, yeah, when you're, if, if we're going to take this, and if you have five directs that report to you, all their input's going to be consolidated into one line on that report around the question, and it's all going to be contained. So your data is combined, and it is anonymous. Mm -hmm. And then telling them, we have two open text comments, and... You know, we have a, an ours, our standard survey is we have a question around what is this person's strengths? What are their greatest opportunities? And we're able to explain to them, whatever you type in here is going to come across verbatim on the right. report. Now, they're not going to be able, it's, it's in there randomized. And so it's not like all the comments from direct reports are in one place. There's no identifiers in there. But if I put, hey, Charles, you know, I think you're doing great. And, you know, we've been great friends since we started on the same day, then you're probably going to know who provided that feedback. Exactly, yeah. And, and just, th just that people know that um, is very helpful. And, and again, on the positive side of 360s, there's a lot of people that when they put in their comments, they'll put little parentheses, hey, this is from Dan, mm -hmm. because they're so open to it. They're so supportive, and they want the person to be so um, to have all the opportunities to succeed. They're like, I'm providing you this feedback, and I'm open to chatting with you about it whenever right. you want. And, and so when they know that, we actually give them, when they have more knowledge and, and when we kind of work through this disruption and give them the green light to connect, people will actually do some amazing things. Yeah, so, agreed. So that one's a, that one's a big one. And, and, you know, we do those. We do those pre-survey webinars, um, you know, it, or the in, an internal sure. resource can do it. But, uh, but that, one's a big, that one's a big one for us. So that's a way to reduce some of the concerns around around the 360 and support through that disruption. When we do the raider selection, you know, we've talked around letting the, the participant choose their raiders. We're really disarming the unknown. Mm -hmm. You know, the unknown has so much power, but it's like when you share a little light on there and you go, oh yeah, you can choose your feedback providers and this is how it works. As that unknown disappears, the flow of information and communication increases, the quality of the report, the likelihood that they'll change increases. So that happens. And then in terms of how do you support through the disruption in terms of a timeline, there are some organizations that come to us and say, hey, we're really busy. We'd like to keep it open for a month. And, um, and I am generally going to them, you know what? If we keep it open to a month, I tell you what's going to happen. We're going to have some people that <laughs> complete it in the first week. We're, and we're going to have some people that complete it in the last week. Yep. And, um, and so just being able to talk with people around that, around, 
let's make a tighter timeline and let's let's reduce that the length of that disruption and so our recommendation is normally two weeks and then we're able to watch on our side around participation if we have some participation goals you know we want to make sure that we hit those want to make sure that the self completes it that the manager completes it mm -hmm. um, but that helps a little bit sometimes think this is an example of where more is not necessarily better right providing the structure and saying this can be open for two weeks and, uh, and then we provide re email reminders in there, but that helps reduce that disruption. And then something around the report delivery is to tell people, I'll tell you exactly when you're gonna get your report. Um, what we like to do is deliver the report 24 to 48 hours prior to the scheduled debrief. Yeah. So I'm gonna talk about the power of the debrief um, and how important that is. But when we get that debrief scheduled and we have it on the calendar between the coach and the participant, then we send that report out. We want to give it to them so they have enough time to read through it, um, to go through it. You know, I tell people, go through it once at a high level and then take some notes and then go through it at a detailed level. What do you notice? What surprises you? What are your strengths or opportunities? And come to that debrief meeting with an early hypothesis yeah. of what you think you want to work on. But we don't want to give it to them two weeks in advance of that debrief where they can be obsessing about it, right. um, where they can be um, just focused on it when it's not as helpful. And so we like that. So that really helps to reduce that disruption is they know the time frame, they've got some time to go through it on themselves, but then they quickly have some support. And this one um, around, I think one of the biggest ways to reduce this disruption is is through a debrief. And, and Charles, I know you like this quote, um, but uh, we don't learn from experience. We learn from the debrief right. of experience. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's so many examples of that. You know, like you don't necessarily learn um, from a crash. You know, maybe you're snowboarding or you're, or you're mountain biking <laughs> and you crash. But you learn from the debrief of it, of mm -hmm. just like, hey, what did I do? And did I hesitate or did I go too strong or was I too hard on my front brakes if I'm mountain biking? And then even in a meeting, you know, we'll have a meeting and we don't necessarily learn from that. We may have some experiences and some feelings of like, that went really well or that didn't go that well. But where we really learn from is the debrief of that yeah. to be able to go and have a conversation with somebody. Hey, what did go well? Because if you just go, it went well, you can't do much with that. But if somebody tells you it went well because you had a purpose and a desired outcomes and an agenda, boy, that's reinforcing. I can move with that. Or it went well because you admitted you didn't know what you were doing, Dan, <laughs> and uh, and you were stumped. Um, just opening that up. So it's the debrief of experience. So getting specific on that, we find that it greatly helps when someone has a debrief. And there's always the choice. Do you want to do it with an internal consultant? Do you want to do it with an external resource like us? Um, there's pluses and minuses to both of those. Um, those debriefs can be 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. Um, and that is a critical part. And, and I'll talk in the next slide around like what we actually do in that. Um, but what, yeah, actually, this is the right time. What we do in that is, is um, we actually help answer the questions about the report, how to read it, which point differentials are important and significant, which ones aren't. How do you look at a 360 report? I was just talking with someone today with a financial background, and I said, this is not an income statement. Yeah. Um, we are not talking about decimals. Uh -huh. A 360 report is thematic. It's looking at themes. And so just helping people to understand that. And then we help them to create um, an action plan and an action plan that's most important to them. So that debrief is probably the biggest thing to turn the disruption into a learning event. When someone has the opportunity to talk about it, um, when they're actually listened to. And we've got another webinar that we've done on actually how to do that. Yeah. And like you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. we do a certification process two or three times a year and I go on site and do it for organizations to actually train them on how to do debriefs. Um, but that's a big one. Are you gonna talk about the Sarah model in the next piece here, the kind of the grieving model? The, the no, but that's a good one go to bring that I up. I always like to touch on that with people because talking about mm -hmm. disruption, Whenever we get feedback and we feel um, like our perceptions don't match or surprising information, we go through the, this, you know, what's called the Sarah model, shock, anger, resistance, and finally acceptance. And so sometimes we're surprised, we might be angry about it, we might feel resistance towards it um, until we finally process it and, and accept what we have. And it's an emotional ex experience, kind of a roller coaster. 
but you need to allow yourself to feel that those feelings and process that and debrief it. And it's helpful to have a one-on-one session with someone to kind of go through that. Um, and you really can't uh, develop an action plan until you get out of that, right? Until you've hmm. kind of um, been able to feel or, or at least process your emotions effectively. Uh, otherwise, if you're stuck in resistance, you won't want to really do anything. Yeah, you won't it. listen to it. You're yeah. not open to that <clears throat> feedback. But yeah, that that's a great point, Charles, of of all this work that we're doing around honoring their agency, yeah. around helping them connect and know that you don't need to do this alone, around supporting them through this disruption, and then recreating the center around what's most important to them are all elf efforts to help them move quicker through that model. Yeah. Like we know they're going to go through it. It's normal, but we can accelerate that process. And mm-hmm. that's really how you get more out of this experience is by accelerating that process. And just one thought on that too, when you talked about acceptance, I, I sometimes tell people and they're pleasantly underwhelmed by my response <laughs> of what is acceptance of a 360 look like? Yeah. What a lot of times people come to it and they think is, I'm going to do everything in there that people told me to. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to tell them, uh, no, you don't need to do that. Mm -mm. Um, Let's pick one of the most, what are your most important goals that you want to accomplish in the next six or 12 months? Okay. And then what does the 360 say about helping you achieve that? Let's pick one or two of those things. And, And that happens. And acceptance does not say and sound like I'm going to do everything. Acceptance sounds like, you know what? I can see why people would say these things. I get it. I get it. And I'm open to focusing on one or the two of these things, and I'm open to having a conversation about this. That's acceptance. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot different than a lot of times people think um, it's kind of like a, a big burrito. I got to eat this whole 360 burrito in one bite. I'm like, if you do that, you're going to get sick. But if you take a little bite here, right. a little bite there, put it down, maybe have something else and come back to it. It's actually a very pleasant experience. So yeah, those are great. Um, how do you help people move through those through that change model? And then our last one, um, our last principle that, uh, well, just this idea that you don't have to do this alone. That's Mm -hmm. that's both around an encouraging thought around a connection and around um, lowering disruption. The next one that we go into is recreate the center. And I've referred to this several times, but when we look at this process and we go through this, um, we're starting it at the beginning and asking them, what do you want to learn? How can this help you? And making that association and recreating the center that the center of this process is not my organization or my boss is telling me that I have to do a 360. The organization is presenting you and inviting you to participate in this process. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this to help you improve on the things that are most important to you. That's a very different mindset. Yeah, and I was going to add, you know, sometimes we have this negativity bias where all we, we hyper-focus on our low scores. We get distracted by the overall message of the 360, and we end up maybe taking a direction, like you're saying, that's not congruent with what we're trying to accomplish this year. So mm-hmm. really the recentering piece is, is this feedback I got a low score? Is it even relevant to mm-hmm. my success? How do I want to incorporate this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I've uh, <coughs> I've done three sixties in the last month where they got some feedback and uh, they've changed roles. And in the previous role, the work with their peers was absolutely critical. Like they couldn't get their job done without their peers. But now they're in a new role, and the most important relationship they have now is with their direct reports. Yeah. So the 360 may be <laughs> highlighting, you really need to improve this relationship here. But when we look at what's most important now, I'll ask them, how important and critical is that group for your success to achieve these goals? And uh, it's very relevant, mm-hmm. making sure that we're matching our strategy to the situation. So recreating the center happens there. Um, recreating the center makes also happens when you're doing rate, rater selection. Mm-hmm. Who are we choosing? The people that are most important to you yep. to help you succeed and get this feedback. And then it can show up around that report delivery, recreating the center. Who does it go to? It goes to you. And then I've referred to this, and this is kind of the big portion of this, but just walking through it one more time around recreating the center we ask people in that debrief, what are the one or two things that are most important to you that you want to accomplish in the next six to 12 months? And we create the entire debrief around that. Yep. And that is so powerful. Like I can hear that. I usually get to that point probably within the first two minutes of a 90 minute debrief. You're right. Yeah. Like I'll get on there and I'll say, Hey, welcome. How are you doing today? Here's our purpose, desired outcomes. Is there anything else that you want to accomplish today? Okay. Have you done a 360 before? And if they say no, I go, well, you know, a common perspective is, we're going to go over the strengths. You say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go over the lowest points sure. and we're going to try to make them better. 
And then I tell them this, well, actually we don't do that. What we're going to do on this call is we're going to, you're going to have you describe what are the one or two most important things. And we're going to build around that. We're going to look at this 360 and see what it says about accelerating your progress on that goal. I can feel it over the phone, whether in there in Malaysia or India or Switzerland um, or here in the U S I can feel the shift of energy and this, this ownership and comfort that happens around. It's about me. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that recreating the center in that process, it honors their agency You know, instead of just we're just you're just going to do whatever the 360 says, it's like you're going to choose what you how you want to use this 360. Wow, that's very empowering. Yeah, because most people, they get on the phone or they sit with the HR person and expect to be told what to do as from the report. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's actually a challenge that we have to talk through sometimes with people. Sometimes that shows up around Mm -hmm. around that. uh, you know, that, that obedience and I'm going to do whatever someone else says. And sometimes it's challenging when I ask people about this, uh, usually in a business environment, they can say, yeah, these are the goals I need to accomplish. But when we connect that to the power and the energy that's present there, everything else moves and flows in a very different way. Yeah. So that's, that's a big thing. And then when we're going through the debrief, we'll just keep coming back to it. We'll look at a question on there and go, Hey, there's a difference here. And then we'll ask, how does this relate to your goal? Is this question important and critical? Yes, it is. Okay, let's get into it. No, it's not. Okay, let's keep moving on. So it just changes It changes that whole interaction. So, so Charles, that's, a, that's, that's our, our main structure. Yeah. You know, and that's the idea is I wanted to illustrate what that plan looked like, what those key questions were, and then how you take these principles and apply them. So those are the key ones. And I'd encourage, if you have any other questions or ideas or suggestions, reach back out to us, either Charles or myself. Um, my contact information is up here at the end of the slide because um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it and how mm-hmm. to continue to make it better. So in terms of just kind of wrapping up, and I do have one more uh, I have one more resource slide for you, Charles. Yes, cause yes. I'm actually working with some clients, and they asked me, like, Dan, are there any books or resources or things that I should watch or or read to get better at 360s and I've developed that so I've got that for you but just kind of to review this of like how did we do Um, just asking you you know the purpose of today's webinar was to help you to get the most out of your 360 experience and do you feel better equipped to get the most out of this experience Mm -hmm. an investment whether you are administrator or participant and then in terms of our desired outcomes have we lowered your stress I hope that there is less stress around this process and less stress around this process for the following reasons. Do you now understand you know, what these basic steps and these questions that you've answered? Can you apply these principles? Honoring agency, inviting connections, support through disruptions, and recreating the center, can you apply those? And then do you feel more confident and capable around the 360 process? So my hope is that you are. You know, The intent of this was to share these, these conversations that I have with people quite often and put them in a way where more people can leverage them. Yeah. So, Hopefully that was uh, that we achieved our purpose and desired outcome. Yeah, and, and I think most, uh, you know, the big question a lot of people have, especially in HR, as they're trying to roll this out, is buying, getting buy-in and support from the senior leadership as well as the other leaders that are going to do this. Because a lot of people think, oh, well, why do we need to do a 360? We give each other feedback all the time, you know. So this helps you to kind of um, lower the barriers, hopefully, that you're encountering, you know, trying to sell this internally. Great. Yeah, it's super helpful for that. And then the last thing that I have for you um, is uh, just some resources. And um, when I thought about them in terms of books that I've read that have been most helpful for me to manage this 360 process and help people go through them, these four came to mind. So really quickly, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, one of the best books ever to read about why people don't do the things that we think they should. Mm -hmm. So fantastic book. And then from Thich Nhat Hanh around how to relax um, just a wonderful book. We're trying to help people relax through this process yep. to debrief. The more relaxed we are, the better. One of the best books I've read, honestly, about engagement has been written here at DecisionWise by Tracy, Engagement Magic. Um, and it's a great application of taking those concepts, engagement concepts of meaning, autonomy, growth, impact, and connection and applying them to our 360 process and to our work. 
And then if you want to go deeper into connection, one of the best books I've ever read about connection is by Johan Hari. He actually did a TED Talk that's entitled Everything You Know About Drugs, I think is wrong, is what it's called. It's uh-huh. got a lot of views. This book is actually um, you know, what he did that research from. And it's just about emphasizing the connection, the importance of connection, the importance of connection either to a spiritual connection, to each other, to our mm-hmm. feedback, to nature, to our bodies. Super helpful. So those ones I found really helpful. And then actually, Charles, in terms of, um, of other resources, <laughs> right. I'd tell you one of the best uh, movies ever and the best exploration around the use of emotions is this movie Inside Out. Right. Um, understanding that they all have a purpose. Because you talked about the Sarah model and all these emotions that come up around 360s. Yeah. Those aren't things that we're trying to avoid. Those are things that we want to understand. It's feedback. It's an energy. Let's move with that. Um, along those lines, too, this new movie that just came out, um, um, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, about Mr. Rogers. If you want to see an exploration of how to navigate through emotions, that is one of the best movies I could recommend. And then the last one, Meeting Gorbachev, around how to lead through change, one of the most fascinating movies I've ever seen. So I just wanted to share those resources so people have those. And just as a final thought is thank you so much. Thanks for spending your time with us. Let us know if you have any questions or suggestions. We'd welcome the opportunity to partner with you. And uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Charles. Thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.